We welcome all of you that have joined us tonight. <clears throat> fellow helpers to the truth, and we have, as always, welcome our participants on live stream who are able to join us. <clears throat> this will be our 21st message in the Christ's coming, a very critical uh, subject. <clears throat> Tonight, Christ's coming and rewards for building. <clears throat> I'm going to endeavor to uh, expound tonight what Jesus is doing now. <clears throat> now that he has received all power in heaven and earth, angels and authorities and principalities being made subject to him, now that he is the one and only potentate, precisely what is he doing? And I'm going to integrate that with our own involvement. Any professed work <clears throat> done in the name of the Lord, whatever it is and whoever does it, if it is not after the manner in which Jesus is working now, is nothing more than of exercise and vanity. So far as eternity is concerned and God is concerned. <clears throat> now, the second coming of Christ is an event associated with a number of things that are all uh, epochal in nature. First and foremost here, Jesus is going to be revealed as he really is. Presently, Jesus is seen through a filter. We don't see him as he is. We just see the, add that glory, his glory, the things pertaining to him, but we, we don't, not yet, we don't see him as he is. What you see is the real Jesus. Now, I'm not implying that it's not the real Jesus. But you just more or less see the hem of his garment. But when Jesus comes again, God's going to be showing, putting him on display. He's going to declare what he is. Not going to be anything different than he is right now. So he's going to be revealed, the revelation of Christ. And then there's a, he's going to come, he's going to reveal God. God's going to be seen. He's going to come in the glory of his Father. That's how the scripture puts it. In other words, God's going to be made known. There'll be no more ambiguity about God. None at all. There's going to be no confusion about God. Who he is, what he does. What his authority is it? It's going to be revealed. And the holy angels, they're going to be revealed. He's going to come in the glory of, his, of the holy angels as well. Luke 9, 26 says, so they're going to, they're, see, people talk about angels, but, <laughs> well, when we see them, that's going to be something else. Amen. There's such a, such an amalgamation of holy spirits that serve God night and day. Every time they're told to go, they go. Whatever they're told to do, they do, then they come back. They're faithful, they're obedient. You're going to see all of them. All He's going to bring all the holy angels with him. Here in this history of mankind, there's been occasions when a person saw an angel. <clears throat> the shepherds saw a, a great company of angels when Jesus was born. Think of seeing them all. <clears throat> <laughs> Does anyone really suppose someone's going to rush out to oppose them? No. And the sons of God are going to be made known. Everybody's going to know when Jesus comes who the real Amen. children of God are. Because then the sons of God will be made known. Amen. When, we, when we see him, then we'll be seen too. And the revelation of the wicked, that's going to happen. All the wicked. See, some of them are disguised now. It's hard to tell who the wicked are. For a long time, even the other disciples didn't know who Judas really was. From day one, he was a son of perdition. From day one. 
Jesus knew it. He chose them so the scripture would be fulfilled because he knew he was going to be betrayed from inside. He was going to be an insider. When they went with them to the house of God, the psalmist said. So all the wicked are going to be made known. When Jesus comes, the wicked will be punished. When Jesus comes. It's taught in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. All those that know not God and obey not the gospel. It's what you get for not knowing God and not knowing the gospel, they're going to get when Jesus comes. Amen. And creation is going to be liberated, Romans 8 tells you. That when the sons of God are made manifest, creation is going to be liberated from the bondage of corruption. Corruption was imposed on creation. Not, not because of anything creation did. But because a defiled people cannot dwell in a holy environment. God will never let this happen. And, and a holy people can't dwell in a defiled environment forever. Now, now we're, here's a people chosen by God, cleansed and washed, and we're in a defiled environment that militates against the soul, competes for your interest. But that's all going to change when Jesus comes again. And as soon as we're freed, sons of God are freed from bondage of corruption, then creation is going to be free to you. And they're anxious about this. They're groaning and travailing in expectation, waiting for the manifestation of the children of God. They can hardly wait. So give them something to be anxious about when you're around. Because I think creation, there's some sense in which creation has it's not understanding like men have. It's not that kind of thing. But there's a, some kind of intuition that creation has. That uh, they knew who Jesus was. Whenever he said to do something, they did it. Yeah. Amen. And if you wonder whether you got that power, just give it a try. Try and feed someone with one loaf of bread. Multitude. Give it a try. People say that uh, they can do miracles. Well... Maybe you could don't start by creating a world that's too ambitious. Create a fly, or maybe a gnat. Better start with a gnat. Creation is going to be liberated when Jesus comes again. The dead are going to be raised. So the for death once and for all is going to be destroyed. There's going to be no more death. There'll be no more death. <coughs> well, that means the annihilationists are wrong. Hmm? The annihilationist, which doctrine is growing at phenomenal rates, has gone viral in the world. That the wicked are ultimately going to be punished for a while and they're just going to be annihilated. This is gained. I could tell you names of people who bought into this, you'd almost faint. This is all going to be exposed. When Jesus comes again, death, nobody else will be ever able to die in any sense after Jesus comes again. You're going to cast death and Hades into the lake of fire. That's it. So people talk about there's a conference going on right now to which a number of people that I personally know are attending on conditioned immortality, conditional immortality. And this is a latest thing among theologians, conditional immortality, that only the righteous will be immortal. I don't know, I don't know what you do with angels, but because they're immortal now. They can't die now. I know these people say, well, only God is immortality. But he does, he confers it also. He confers immortality. 
right now in your spirit, you've got, you've got the seeds of immortality in your spirit. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die, Jesus said. Well, this is going to be made known when Jesus comes again. He'll end the reign of death, <coughs> and then it will be the day of judgment, of course. These are some things that are going to occur when Jesus comes. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I do want to mention it again. Nobody can afford to be wrong about Jesus on anything. I'm serious now. About anything about Jesus, you cannot be wrong. You cannot. Men may say we have different opinions. You cannot be wrong about Jesus. Now, I know this because eternal life is knowing God and Jesus Christ. So you can't know Jesus and be wrong about him. Amen. I don't know why people have chosen to think that you can be have an opinion about the second coming of Christ. I, I don't know how who started this or when it started. It was fairly early. But there are people that know you got to. You can't be wrong about why Jesus died. I mean, you can't. Most people will acknowledge this. You can't. You, you can't be wrong about whether or not Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God and ever live with that. Most most Christians know this. But somehow they think you could be wrong about Christ's second coming, and there's, that he's opened up areas where you can have a varied opinions about this. Well, you can't. You can't have varied opinions about Christ. This, this gospel is the record God has given of his son. It includes his coming. You've got to be right about it. I understand you may not understand all the ins and outs of it and some of the implications of it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you've got to have the basic understanding has got to be right. You're not going to come back, sneak back in, sneak the church out, and come back a thousand years later. This is, this is just wrong. I don't want to spend time on that. It's too depressing. Now let me uh, briefly go over, because we're talking about Christ coming, Christ coming and rewards for building. So I, I've got to establish, first of all, what exactly is Jesus doing now? What is Jesus doing now? Is he idle? Well, no, he's not idle. Now, as a background to what he's doing now, <coughs> Jesus is governing the world. It may not look to you like he is, but... <coughs> Who cares what you think about this? Amen. The government's been placed on his shoulder. Amen. And it's an everlasting government. And there's not going to be any end to it. Amen. So he's governing the world. Angels, authorities, principalities, powers. These are the high, lofty spirits that rule the world. They're subject to Christ. He says, stop. They stop. He says, sends out strong delusion over there. Those people didn't receive a love of the truth. Uh -huh. They go and do it. Uh -huh. He's governing the world. He's subduing all things to himself. <laughs> Philippians 3.21 says, he's head over all things to the church. Ephesians 1.22. Jesus is the head of, of the church. It said, but that's not what Ephesians 1.22 is talking about. It says he's the head of He's made head over all things to the church. That is not talking about him being the head of the church. He is the head of the church and the savior of the body. But he means he's been made head over all things and has been given to the church in that capacity. Amen. There isn't anything or anyone or any circumstance that you face that he's not over, Amen. that he doesn't govern. That he couldn't stop at an instant. Amen. Amen. He's over everything. <coughs> He's the one that's working all things together for the good of his people. Yeah, that's right. See, when you say, well, I thought it said God's doing that, but God has turned things over yeah. to the Son. He's put all things into my hand. Jesus made this plain. He's put all things into my hand. So I'm telling you now what Jesus is doing now. Christ's government is global. 
just as Proverbs 21 says, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord, and he turns it like a river of waters. God can make kings do what he wants them to do, whether they want to or not. He can move Cyrus, a Persian, to superintend the building of the temple of God. How's that? <laughs> he called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. He called him to chase in Israel. See? That's the backdrop to what he's doing now. He's over everything. There's no, there's no element of power he does not right now possess. Amen. There isn't anything right now that, from this view, is not really under his feet. The revelation of it is yet to happen, but the, the substance of it presently exists. Satan is under Jesus' feet right now. In fact, he was under Jesus' feet when he came on earth in a body. In a body, Satan never did attempt to attack or argue with Jesus. In the flesh, we're talking about in the flesh. He was disguised. He's incognito. But the demons knew who he was. Hey, we know who you are. He's yeah. actually the only one who doesn't know who Jesus is are people on earth. Everybody in heaven knows, everybody in hell knows, the demons know, Satan knows, and man, they're the only ones that don't know. Uh -huh. But when he comes again, then they'll know too. And you've got from now to then to get ready right. for the revelation. <laughs> now, what exactly is Jesus' primary work? What is, the, what, is, what is the focus of what he's doing? He's building his church. I will build my church. That's a summation of what he's, what he's been sent to do, what he's doing right now. He's interceding for those that are coming to God through him, Hebrews 7.25. We're talking about what Jesus is doing now. And if you want the advantage of Jesus' work, you somehow have got to get involved with what he's doing now. And this is spelled out in Scripture. We don't have to guess about it. Now he's mediating the new covenant. Hebrews 8, 6 tells you that. He's mediating the new covenant. What does that mean? Mediating the new covenant. He's, he's getting it to you. The new covenant, I could quote the entire New Testament in just a few seconds. And it's all spelled out in Scripture. This is the covenant I will make after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. I will, I will not remember their sins anymore. They will be my people. I will be their God. That's the new covenant. It's found in Hebrews 8. 8 to 13 is quoted by Jeremiah and Jeremiah 31 to 34. There's not one single commandment in it. It's all a promise. And that's the covenant Jesus is mediating. He's writing God's law on people's hearts. He's putting God's law on people's minds. He's remitting people's sins. He's making sure they know God and they're the people of God. And because of him, God remembers their sins no more and is merciful of their unrighteousnesses. That's what Jesus is doing now. Amen. He's a mediator of the covenant. He has stated another way, 1 Peter 3.18, he's bringing us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, that he might bring us to God. That's what Jesus is doing now. You say, well, I thought we we're already with God. Well, you just been, you're just in a vestibule. You're just in a vestibule. You're not in the actual presence of God in his fullness. You're just being introduced to his presence so you won't be consumed by it when it's made known. He's bringing us to God, 1 Peter 3.18. Or stated another way, he's bringing many sons to glory. He's enabling them to safely negotiate through this world, this present evil world is called, Galatians 1, 4, 
and make it safely to glory. That's what Jesus is doing now. We're talking about what he's doing right now. And he's finishing the faith that he started. He's the author and finisher of our faith, and that's what he's doing now, finishing the faith that he started. And he's shepherding and feeding his flock. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. Hebrews 13, 20 says. So he's nourishing his people because you can't get to heaven with nothing to eat. You've got to be nourished because you've got an adversary to fight. You've got a tough terrain to negotiate. You've got to be able to stand and fight. You've got to be able to stand in the faith and keep the faith and so forth and appropriate the things God has given. And you need, you need to have strength that comes from food. So he's feeding his flock. And he's upholding and stabilizing his people. Jude says, now God's able to keep you from falling. Are you, are you concerned about whether or not you can fall? Well, you take Jesus out, and you ought to be concerned about it. But Jesus is not out of this situation. He is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne with exceed, before his presence with exceeding joy. This is what Jesus is doing now. Amen. His focus is on his people. You gotta see this. <coughs> That's number one. Number one in Jesus' society is his people. The Father said, Get them home safely. Bring them to the fire and the water. Give them what they need. Get these children home through the devil's territory and do it safe. And that's what he's doing right now. <coughs> and he's ass assessing his churches along the way. <coughs> As Revelation 3 picks out 7 and he teaches you, Jesus is assessing his churches. Now he picked out seven churches in Asia and he told you what he thought about them. And he had John write it down. So billions of people now know about these seven churches. Over history, billions of people know what the, they know the church at Ephesus was punctilious in trying false prophets, but they left their first love. And Jesus, I got this against you. If you don't do it, I'm going to turn you out. You better get back to this. Do you think churches like that don't still exist? This is what Jesus is doing now. Jesus is not assessing governments now. I don't want to have a lot of tolerance for Christian leaders that are always critiquing the government. These people must not have much to say. That's not, that's not, Jesus doesn't, he's going to destroy them. His kingdom is going to swallow up their kingdoms. Amen. And it's going to fill the whole earth. Amen. It's already toppled the major ones. Global governments. People are afraid of one world empire, you know, these guys. We may, we may have a one world empire. Well, that's the only kind there was for hundreds of years. That's what Babylon was, was a one world, one, one world government. Medio Persian, one world government. Greece, one world government. Rome, one world government. I think we talked about this recently, but there's a reason why God let one world governments be established. Because that's the kind of government he gave to Jesus. I insist that a person from the United States has a very difficult time comprehending what a kingdom is. Now, there are some countries in the world, they are kingdoms. And those that are under them know the people don't own anything under a kingdom. The government owns it all and distributes it to them. And people are vassals of the government. That's, what, that's exactly how God's government operates. You don't really have anything except what God's given you. Amen. And you've got to take care of it or take it away from you. So God allowed these kingdoms to rise. Then in the days of those kingdoms, he set up his kingdom, and now people could understand what a king meant and what a kingdom meant. See, that's why, that's why these things were up on earth. 
But now that we're involved in the work, now that he's established what a kingdom is, what it means to be overall, see, a lot of people still don't know what that means. A lot of church people still don't comprehend overall. They don't know what that means. They can't conceive of a Savior that's overall, and it actually does dictate what's done yes. yeah. and what's to be done. So during this age, now that he's established that, he is building his church. That's his primary work. And he's making it for a habitation of God. The church is being built together, Ephesians 2.22, for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God is making a place for God to dwell. That's what he's doing. And the day is going to come when God himself, Revelation 21 says, God himself shall dwell with them. He's going to come to, and that's what Jesus is doing now. He's preparing that place. <coughs> now, in this work, he has elected to use co-workers, and this is where we get to our text. He has solicited co-workers to join with him in this work. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 Paul said, we are laborers, we are workers together with God. He's called us into the project of building his church. We're laborers together with God, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Then he says, "Who the, what he's laboring on, ye are God's husbandry. Vineyard, we call it. You are God's building. The church, not talking about the community, that's not what he's talking about. Talking about the church, you are what God is going to live in. You are the building of being made for God. This is what Jesus is doing. And now he's called us into the process. Involved in this, some plant, some water. God gives the increase. What kind of increase? It's just this building that Jesus is building. It's beginning, it's growing and increasing. <coughs> John would call them fellow helpers unto the truth. So I want to ask you, and this is something that you, you want to think seriously about yourself. What are you contributing to this building program? You will notice that when uh, that all the letters of the scripture were written to the churches, you probably noticed this. There was one letter that was written to a governor, like Theophilus, some kind of a political dignity, but he was a believer. It was written to establish him. You probably noticed this, that Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, but his ministry was to the churches. He said, I come to testify of the wonderful grace of Christ, the riches of his grace, that I make, might make known the riches of his grace. All right, now, if you're a Bible student, and I trust you are, can you think of one unsaved person that Paul made known the riches of God's grace? I don't want to just just think about it and research it at home and see if you can find it. See if see if he ever told somebody like Agrippa about the riches of God's grace or Felix. See if you can find somebody or the pen in Athens. See if you can find someone where he told the riches of his grace. You will find it was his. It's the church that has told the riches of his grace, and all preaching of the gospel to bring people out of sin is in order, it's not just in order to get them out of sin. It's in order to get them into the building program. Amen. That's really what it's all about. Now, unfortunately, <coughs> since religion has been systematized and institutionalized, it's a lot easier for people to exploit making converts than building up saints. You can gain a name quicker. Build a better institution, far more far-reaching institution. If you did, in, if the person did indeed save someone from their sins, I mean, if, if that 
is true. But the real work starts after that. That initiates the work. Conversion initiates the work. But what Jesus is doing, the focus of his attention is not conversion. The focus of his attention is sanctification. Amen. That's the focus of his attention. And conversion is necessary to that, I understand. <coughs> you see, Jesus said, I am the vine. You're the branches. And you've been called in to do into the work Jesus is doing. Now, our text speaks of rewards being given to the builders, the people that built. And it says, I'm a master, I'm a wise master builder. He that built all things is God, the scripture says. And the church is God's building. 1 Corinthians 3 9. Ye are God's building. Jesus is a supreme builder. Paul was a master builder. He was a that knew how to build this habitation for God. He knew how to equip people to be inhabited by God. Paul knew how to do this. He's a wise master builder. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. But he had to have a certain thing planted in a certain kind of watering before he could have this increase, which has to do with building the, building the structure itself. <coughs> now, care must be taken to every person who builds. And he, Paul is very careful on this matter. He says, let every man take heed how he builds on this foundation. Amen. There's one foundation, which is Christ. Everything is built on him has to integrate with him. Whatever's put on this foundation has got, it's got to be able to be merged with Christ himself. It has to become one with Christ. You can't put someone on this foundation that is alienated or that is not joined to the Lord or that doesn't love the Lord as God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength or doesn't have the law of God written on his heart or doesn't have the law of God put in his mind. You can't put a person like that in this building. Now, some people try, and it, the text is going to tell you what God's going to do about that. The, pit, the building that's being built for God to inhabit, that's what Jesus is doing, is being fitly framed together. This is Ephesians 2.21. In whom, in Christ, all the building, or the whole building, built it together, is fitly framed together, and grows into the temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are built together, for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Well, this is what God is, this is what Jesus is doing now. He's building this church, building this temple, building this habitation for God, building a place that doesn't burn up when God comes in it. Even the glory of God's made known that Christ come, and the nature is gonna it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be consumed. They're gonna go up in a holocaust. It wasn't made, it's gonna it's gonna be released from the bonds of corruption, see? Paul said, God's given me this grace to be a wise master builder. I laid the foundation, which is Christ. I put down what God's going to build on. I put down, if anything's going to succeed in the name of the Lord, it's got to integrate with my son, God said. It's got, it's got to be part of him. If it's not, they put foreign material they put foreign material in this building, and it's not good. You can't lay another foundation. Some people have tried to lay another foundation. They've, they've actually tried to lay one. There are Galatians that someone, someone come in there and tried to lay another foundation. Corinth, they tried to, some teachers did the same thing. They came in and tried to lay another foundation. They, Paul said they preached another Jesus and another gospel and another spirit. It, was, it wasn't the real foundation. That's why it fell apart. 
Why, do, why were all those troubles at Corinth? Is that like a standard outcome for people that are converted? Is that what we need to expect to happen? Is all kind of weaknesses and abuses of that to break out in the church? It's because they had another foundation they'd built on. Someone had come in there and usurped the ministry of Paul, and he wasn't casual about addressing it. Now, that's why these troubles exist, brethren, in, quote, the churches. It was the same in the churches in Asia that had fault. They had allowed things to be believed. He said, you've got some people in your church that believe the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. He didn't say that they were teachers at that point. There was a church where there was a teacher. He said, you've got some people in your church that, don't, that believe stuff that's not right. Yeah. And I'm against you because of that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can't build on that. This is competing with what Jesus is doing. Yeah. Jesus isn't working with a flawed church. I'm sorry. He's working with a sanctified body. And God's grace is there to ensure that it stays sanctified and stays clean and stays pure. That's why the doctrine is when you sin, you confess it, you abandon it, you devote your members to Christ. Why? Because that's the only thing that will survive the judgment of God. If a person is in fundamental disagreement with Jesus, they are fundamentally unlike Jesus. They don't have a view of the world that Jesus has. They don't have a view of discipleship that Jesus has. They don't have a view of loving that Jesus has. They, they may look like they're part of the church. But when Jesus comes, he's going to show you they aren't. Amen. <coughs> if any man's work is, abides, it's a judgment. The judgment's like a day of fire. God, this is God's nature. A fire goes before him and destroys everything and it's in its wake. It's unlike God. This is why he had to have Jesus to just keep from destroying humanity. Now, when God comes, there's not going to be any more veils. There's not going to be any more hiding of Jesus' glory or God's glory. And it's going to consume whatever Jesus died to take away. Whatever he died to take away, if it's still present, well, I tell you, you don't want to be in that kind of situation. Amen. Now, Paul makes this statement in 1 Corinthians 3.11. <coughs> Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now he says, <clears throat> take heed how you build on this foundation. Now, you have... Uh, to really appreciate what he's saying, you, you have had to have had the experience of meeting with a lot of preachers to really ex appreciate what he's saying here, because it's just it's just phenomenal what they talk about, and it's almost a universal dilemma. We went overseas and found that this situation. Some of our others have teaching overseas found the same situation. They find. Uh, Another, another kind of building is going on. Something that Jesus isn't building. See, Jesus is building his church, but there's something going, there's something being built in the Christendom that Jesus isn't building. Amen. And it started back in the first century. Paul saw it and he warned the people, watch out. Take heed how you build on this foundation. <clears throat> And he said that some some of wood, that some tried to put wood hay in stubble. Now he's talking about people, brethren. He's not talking about a category of human works that are wood hay and stubble. In the first place, your works are not built on Jesus. They're not integrated with Jesus. You are the one that's integrated with Jesus. He's talking about people. There are people in the church professed church that are wood, hay, and stubble. They are consumable. They will not be able to survive the revelation of God and of Christ. And Paul tells them ahead of time, don't let these people be part of what God's doing. 
There are still people trying to get us to put them on the foundation. But he said, you take heed. Here's what's going to happen when Jesus comes. If any man's work, which is the people, 1 Corinthians 3.9, Paul tells the Corinthians, you are my work. The people that are converted, they're the person's work. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. What that mean? He wasted his time. His ministry was a fat waste of time. And God, quite frankly, does not honor time wasters. He tells them ahead of time, you, you're going to work for me? You'd better be doing what my son is doing and be a co-worker together with him. You know there's going to, can you just imagine, you just kind of have to imagine this, but some large, see today we've got churches that are 10, 20, 30,000 people. Can you imagine What's going to happen when the fire passes through some of these places? What's going to be left? It says they would suffer loss. I know, I know there's a denomination that teaches, well, this is your, your good works and bad works, and if your bad works are burned up, you'll still be saved. Don't worry about that. But he's not talking about that. He's telling you why he said to Galatia, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid I have wasted my time down there. Told the Thessalonians the same thing. He said, I'm afraid I don't want to labor in vain. Laboring in vain is not comely. There are certain, how do I say this? There are, there are certain mission fields that have had enough preaching in them to convert the world. And they still are just like they always been. Citadels of immorality and sin, and still, what's happened? Why is it that way? Why did the when they preached the gospel and Acts, they turned the world upside down? Things changed. People were changed. Why are these are wasted ministries? These are people putting wood, hay, and stubble, and the world counts wood, hay, and stubble, but God doesn't. So if any man builds wood, hay, and stubble. He's going to burn that out. It won't be, there'll be no record of him in the, in the workbook. And he will suffer loss, though. Time he could have earned some interest from what he was given and accrued a reward. He will have lost that time. And then he, he's got to pass through the fire, too. He's got to pass the fire test, too. And he's going to be saved so as by fire. No one's going to get into heaven because they were a preacher. <laughs> If they weren't God's kind of preacher, they don't get in. That's all. It's just that cut and dry. And then in this very text, Paul issues a warning. He says, now, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, this, I can remember when this, I was a young man, this scared me. I read the voice. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be in that category. It's the promise. Don't think for one moment that God didn't mean this. If anybody defiles the temple of God, what did he mean? Puts wood, hay, and stubble in it. Now, most of us that have, uh, are church people, and some of us that have preached, know that there's a lot of undesirables to say it mildly, in the professed church. My question is, who put them in there? How did they get in? How did they pass the membership test? Because hmm? Jesus doesn't put people like this in his body. Amen. He purges them, he sanctifies them, he cleanses them, puts his law on their heart, then he, brings, then he adds them. Yeah. Then he adds them to the church. After he settled the sin matter, empowered them, filled them with his spirit, given them all the resources they needed, then he puts them in. Whoever puts them in before, take heed. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God uh, destroy. Now the point is, in Christ's labors now, 
The point is for the fruit to remain. Jesus said, I'm the, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He says, now I've, you've not chosen me, I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and, and that your fruit should remain. That is gold, silver, precious stone, see. And whatsoever you ask the Father, then he'll give it to you. I think there's a lot of unanswered prayers by leaders who appear to be concerned because they don't pass this test of building on the foundation. They just have allowed inferior materials to be identified with Christ's church. And Jesus will not tolerate it. And his second coming will reveal. See, we can't make preliminary judgments. I don't know. I can't give you a list of who's wood and hay and stubble. That's, that's not our business. Our business is to make sure to do our best and not to put those kind of materials in. And what, what does that mean? That means you've got to preach the pure gospel. You can't preach an easy gospel. You've got to tell people what Jesus said about if you're going to be my disciple, you have to leave everything else. Amen. You have to deny yourself and take up your cross every day and follow me. You can't love anybody more than you love me. Amen. You got to tell people at the front, at the front part. Charles Finney started the process of prayer altars and invitations, and it, it pretty well captures captured the Christian world. Where they try and talk people into. Tell sad story. When I was coming up, there was preachers would tell sad stories. At the end of their message, they'd tell a story. And it'd be pretty sad, you know. Maybe, maybe a man, his dog was run over or something. But they get you crying, you know, and make you, oh, yeah, this was fashionable now. <laughs> if some of you have been around for a while, maybe remember these days. And they'd have books to have all these kind of stories. And preachers could read those books. They tried to talk people into coming to Christ rather than telling them what Christ demanded and then that God gives, Jesus gives you the resources to do what he says to do. You can get up and leave your business on a moment's notice and get up and follow Jesus. James and John and Peter and Andrew, all four of them, they just, <laughs> they just got up and left and followed Jesus and spent all their time with him. And Matthew did the same thing. He, he, he was sitting at the receipt of where they're taking taxes, and Jesus says, follow me, and he just got up. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, see, with the call of God and with the call of the gospel, there's grace that goes out with it that will enable people who believe it to respond to it. Amen. When Jesus looked at a lame man and said, pick up your bed and walk, that word was accompanied with power, so all it remained is for this man to want to do it, which is really all he could really do. All he could really do is want to get up. But when he did, he was enabled. Now that's the kind of people you can put on a foundation. You tell people what God re has requested of them, and it's, he's requested their whole heart, their whole mind, their whole mind, all their strength. It's mine now. You love me and serve me with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul. And then he gives you everything that's required to do that. And quite frankly, it's, it's a very enjoyable process when you find yourself willing the day of his power. Amen. Now, the point of all this has been that when Jesus comes, he's going to reward the builders. The rewards are accrued. <clears throat> You don't get your reward, a reward here and a reward there. and They're all accrued and laid up in heaven. Amen. And you only get the reward at the end, and you get it all at the end. And, of course, if you don't have a reward coming, well, there's, there's another kind of reward, but we don't recommend that at all. So the acid test is be administered at the end when Jesus comes. Then... The thorough evaluation will take place. Everyone who's joined in the work, co laborer with God, workers together with God, joint heirs with Christ, everyone has done that. 
Oh, they're going to be glad they did. He's going to bring his reward with them. Oh, I come quickly, my reward's with me. Going to bring it. All the builders <coughs> are going to be rewarded. And I'm telling you, if you think about it now, and you devote your mind to it, and you get caught up in it, it'll have an impact on your whole person. It'll affect your entire person. You'll have a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And you'll be able to say, well, if God's for us, who can be against us? And you have trouble. You say, I know that this is going to turn out to my salvation. Why? Because he was laboring. He was working on the building. Amen. There's an old uh, southern gospel song that said about working on the building. The song talks about helping God, working on the building. He said, if you were a preacher or a wife or whatever, what would you do? I said, I'd do what I was supposed to do, and then I'd work on the building. So I'm calling on you to work on the building. Amen. Work on building God's people. That's not all you do. It's the focus. It's the focus of what you do. See, Jesus doesn't only feed his flock. He seeks and saves sinners too. But the seeking and the saving is not his fundamental work. It's his introductory work. His fundamental work is get these children home to God, safe and sound, and to God's glory. Join, join in the work. Be part of it. Brother Michael, I believe, has our exhortation tonight.